Hello and welcome back to Historical Geology. Today I want to cover chapter 15, which deals with Mesozoic life. And some of the highlights for chapter 15 include the development of new type of plant. And these are the flowering plants, the angiosperms, which really develop in the Cretaceous period. We also note that the Jurassic landscape was dominated by ferns, conifers, cycads, and ginkgos. The conifers, cycads, and ginkgos were all, were all trees that were forming during this uh, Jurassic lime, landscape. And then the underbrush was mostly the ferns. We also see that dinosaurs evolved from dinosaur morphs in late Triassic time. And we want to emphasize that dinosaurs are different than reptiles. They might have evolved from a stem reptile, but they're very different. They're most likely warm-blooded, and we'll look at some evidence for why they were, we consider them warm-blooded. We also will find flying reptiles and marine reptiles flourish during this time. And note that the flying reptiles, like the pteranodons and pterodactyls, they're not dinosaurs, they're reptiles. And as well as the mosasaurs and plesiosaurs that we'll find in the, in the marine realm, those are just marine reptiles. Birds evolved from dinosaurs in the Jurassic, and we find that mammals evolved from a reptile-like Cynodonts. Remember, the cynodonts are those therapsids uh, that evolved from a proterotherid in from the Pennsylvanian period. And then finally, the the chapter will end with the the end Cretaceous or the the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction. One thing we should note in terms of new species in the oceans, we start seeing a, a new type of reef builder. And th these are these hexacorals. And the hexacorals are the scalactrinians that I've talked about. They're the modern corals. We have those today. So they really start taking off and, be, and building these new reefs. We also see that for a brief period after the Permian mass extinction, the Great Dine, because there were very few invertebrates that would eat the cyanobacteria off of the sea floor, shallow water sea floor, stromatolites really started flourishing. And they left in the fossil record, especially in the early Triassic, we find shallow water deposits with this elephant skin. And the elephant skin is this sort of kind of wrinkly surface that's just the dried out cyanobacteria or mats um, of cyanobacteria that, that would dry out on the surface. And then we find that mollusks, especially the clams, the bivalves, really start taking off. And they, they really, because brachiopods sort of, they didn't go extinct, but they, their numbers reduced. Bivalves took advantage and they really started taking hold. Remember that by Cretaceous time, we're seeing those rudest reefs forming of, of bivalves. And then we see some organisms going back to the sea. In this, in this case, the nothosaurs are some of the first marine reptiles to start making it back to the ocean. See, these were maybe about maybe 10 to 12 feet long, uh, marine reptiles. And also we want to point out that the, that end mass extinction in the Permian, we lost the benthic fusilinids. Remember those are the foraminifera that are anywhere from around one to up to 10 centimeters long. And then the, the Fenestella, the lacy bryzoans go extinct. The rugos and tablet corals go extinct. And we, we finally say goodbye to our, our good friends, the trilobites. The marine invertebrates also we, that we see in the Mesozoic include the cephalopods and gastropods. So remember, gastropods are, are mollusks, are snails. Cephalopods are the squids. And so the, I talked a little bit about turritella snails. Uh, but let's, and we talked about cephalopods, the different types of suture patterns indicating their ages. But we haven't really said much about these belemnoids. And the belemnoids are very similar to modern type squids. There were predators, uh, and the only, thing, the only hard part on their body was this counterweight that we find in the fossil record. And this counterweight was more uh, a kind of a cigar shape, and it was a heavy structure, and it acted to offset the buoyant effect of gas within the shell of the cephalopod. And remember that nautiloids are still found today uh, in the South Pacific, but the ammonoids went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. In terms of Mesozoic plankton, we see foraminifera really start taking off. And so remember, we did have the, the benthic foraminifera, the fusilinids in the Permian. Then we see a real diversification of foraminifera as planktonic organisms. And they really start taking off toward the, the latter part of the Cretaceous, kind of the earlier latter part of the Cretaceous. So this Aptian Albium stages, which correspond to about maybe 120 
a million years ago to about maybe 90 million years ago. Remember, the Cretaceous ends about 65 million years ago. And so they really become good guide fossils. So this Globigerina is really a classic that we look at in the fossil record. We also see that Coccolithophores begin to uh, diversify in the Jurassic, and these are phytoplankton that make these calcium carbonate shells or, or shields, and they're really important in the Cretaceous when we had calcite seas where we had uh, more rapid seafloor spreading because Pangaea was rifting. We have huge deposits in the Cretaceous of these Coccolithophores, and they make up the uh, White Cliffs of Dover, over here in England. So that's a pretty huge deposit from these coccolithophores during some of this time of the calcite seas. And then we also see the, the radiation of diatoms beginning in the Cretaceous, uh, and they're still really abundant today. In fact, they're super important in terms of photosynthetic organisms because of producing oxygen. Uh, back in, in Cretaceous time, or Mesozoic time, they're, they're producing about 40% of all the photosynthesis in the oceans of planktonic organisms, so they're important oxygen producers there. And they made a pretty large biomass, so they're really important for the base of the food chain. And then we see another plankton develops are the dinoflagellates. And dinoflagellates, uh, they have two flagella that kind of whip around, and these guys can kind of move around in the water column, but they're weak swimmers. Some of them like Noctiluca, the modern variety Noctiluca will have a bioluminescence and they kind of glow when the water is agitated. Some of them uh, are responsible for, for the red tides that we have. In terms of plants on land, the Jurassic landscape is, is sometimes called the age of cycads because cycads is a new group that develops in the Triassic and really proliferates in this Jurassic time. And we still have a few of these cycads around today. So it's a Jurassic, pretty ancient plant. It still survives today, mostly tropical. But during Jurassic time, it was very abundant. Uh, so were the conifers, right? The conifers, which are the taller trees that you see in the background here. So those are the, the evergreens that we can think about. There's another variety of cycads called the psychiodoids, and these were uh, very similar in size and style as the cycads. And then we also have the ginkgo trees that developed during this time. And there we have some modern species here. So this ginkgo biloba. And then here's fossil Jurassic ginkgo trees. So, and then obviously we still had the understory of the ferns. So looking at this Jurassic landscape, we have these understory of ferns. We have the conifers. And here are some cycads in the background here. And then by Cretaceous time, we see the flowering plants develop, the angiosperms. So for the first time, we see color on the landscape. And so there is a, a distinct coevolution of flowering plants with insects and to some extent birds, because one thing the angiosperms rely on are pollinators like insects and birds. Going back to the gymnosperms, remember, they're relying on wind as a pollinator. In terms of diversity of reptiles, recall that the reptiles started from a common ancestor, a protorotherid. When we look at the, that branch, there's a branch called the archosaurs. And the archosaurs are going to be the dinosaurs, the birds, and the crocodiles. And they're also called the thecodonts. Remember, thecodont means socket tooth. Their teeth are pretty much the same shape but they have different sizes. And then uh, we talked about polycosaurs, so those are the synapsids. They eventually became the therapsids and eventually the mammals. We talked about the marine reptiles a little bit. We talked about the nososaur, but some of the larger marine reptiles include the ichthyosaurs, which are very dolphin-like, uh, although they're reptiles. Plesiosaurs, which are the long neck swimming reptiles. And then the mosasaurs, which are the really giants of the Jurassic and Cretaceous seas. And then we also have lizards, snakes, the tuatara, which is mostly in New Zealand, and turtles. So again, thinking about that protorotherid, Pennsylvanian Permian tide time, and then we're looking at the synapsids and the diapsids, which are going to lead to the stegodonts, which are going to be the archosaurs and eventually lead to the dinosaurs that we want to talk about. Reptiles is that they're ectothermic, which means they 
cannot regulate their own body temperature. They not that they're cold blooded. They're they're the temperature of their surroundings. So if it's warm, they're going to be warm. But they need an external warming source. They really don't have an internal warming source. Recall that they needed the amniote egg to be away from water. Also, they have that keratinized skin, that tough scaly skin, and they're going to have that internal fertilization, but then lay the eggs. When we're looking at the diversity of reptiles, here's our stem reptile, protorotherid, and then we have the, the turtles, tuatara, snakes, and lizards. That, that involves a branch, and note that these organisms really diversify in the Triassic, late Permian Triassic time, and then we're seeing the, the snakes diversifying in the Jurassic, and separating from lizards here. Now for the plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs, these are marine reptiles, so they're breaking off in the Permian, so they definitely have a different path or clad than the archosaurs. So the archosaurs are the thecodonts, and they're going to lead to the crocodiles. So the pterosaurs, the bird hip and lizard hip di dinosaurs, and then the modern birds, which are really uh, evolved from dinosaurs, the soliosaurs, and uh, we call these archosaurs here. So we'll say more about these as we go along. So when we look at reptiles, remember, ectothermic, they have the amniote eggs, internal fertilization, tough scaly skin, that keratin skin, and their legs kind of go out the side of their body. So they're, whereas the, the dinosaurs had their limbs directly under their body, so they were better for load bearing, which means they were faster, more, they were quickly able to, to move around. They're probably endothermic, which means they could regulate their own temperature, and we'll discuss some reasons why scientists believe this is so. They have elongate bones in the palate, a ball and socket fe femur, the pelvis anchored to the vertebral column, the reduced fibula, and remember we talked about these thecodonts. An interesting experiment was done in South America where they took a, a chicken embryo and they added an enzyme which, because it has a gene expression already in the organism, uh, one thing we see with Deinonychus, which is a soliosaur, and eventually they led to birds. Soliosaurs have this fibula which is long and it would attach to the ankle bone over here, whereas in Chickens, modern chickens, they have a fibula, but it doesn't extend all the way down. It kind of tapers off. These scientists in Chile, I think it was, were able to add an enzyme and to allow the, the gene, which does occur in chickens, to grow that fibula. And it did grow a fibula that would anchor down to its, its ankle bone. So again, just showing that birds have those genes that dinosaurs had, so they're closely related. Again, the archosaurs, thecodonts, dinosaurs, so we have the ancestral archosaurs, and now we're really looking at the, we'll look at the ornithischian dinosaurs, which some people call the bird hip dinosaurs, and the sauricician dinosaurs. All ornithischian dinosaurs were vegetarian, whereas for the sauricician, some were carnivores, like the tyrannosaurs here, or the carnosaurs, and some were vegetarian, like the sauropods, which are the long-necked dinosaurs. Also, theropods, which are the carnivorous dinosaurs, theropods, a class of these, or a family of these, called the soliosaurs, led rise or evolved to the modern birds. So again, this is looking at the ornithischian and sauricician dinosaurs. And so when we're looking at the hips, the ornithischian dinosaurs have the pubis perilous, parallel to the ischium, Whereas for the lizard hip or sauricician dinosaurs, they're separated. And you can see that when we're looking at the ornithischians, we have the vegetarian dinosaurs. So there's Corythosaurus, uh, Iguanodon would be in this class as well. Pachycephalosaurus had the, the bony plate on his head. The Ceratopsians, which are the different types of Triceratops. Then we have the Stegosaurs, An Ankylosaurs, which are the heavily armored bony dinosaurs here with a tail club and then for the sauricicians there are the the tubes the the sauropods which are the long neck dinosaurs like brachiosaurus here and then the theropods here like t-rex and other soliosaurs